All right. Well, I, I don't know if, if any of you would, would agree with me. I'm guessing many of you probably would. Children offer a great perspective. And I, found, I find myself in my own life, um, when I find myself in different seasons, looking at a different season than somebody else, and it offers perspective on my own. And, you know, Pastor Miles mentioned the, the fathers off, or the fathers who are here, and the um, women off in the uh, women's retreat, and, and every, single, every single family in here, we're all in different situations in our life. And children in particular always remind me kind of where I've been and how things have changed over a course of time. And I was talking to one of our school staff members this week during lunch, and I was talking about my youngest um, and how he made the transition this year from preschool to pre-K. Ooh. And yeah, and so, and he had, a, I love, I, he had a little bit of a rough time because, you know, there's not as much playing when you get to pre-K. There's more, there's more things you have to do. And, and, and it got us on a conversation talking, we started talking about how, like, it seems like in life, it feels like you're always being prepared to handle more. You know, I, I remember, I mean, some of you are maybe in this stage in life where, it, um, if there's any college kids or high school kids here, you're thinking about what's coming next. And I remember like when I got out of college and I thought it was this crazy huge thing to get up at 6.30 in the morning and go to work. And I just thought work was so hard. And, and then I had children and then you get more responsibilities. And, you know, and, and, and I think we can all think about different ways in which God has, in which we have, we have taken on more responsibilities. And as time goes on, you learn to handle more and more responsibility. And, you know, I know that even when your kids leave the home, you still, it doesn't mean that you don't feel responsible and you don't care for them. And, and, and those who are retired, it doesn't mean that, that your responsibilities go away, you just get different responsibilities. And so, I guess what I'm saying is as time goes on, it feels oftentimes like more and more and more is happening and our culture kind of teaches us that you should just take on more and more and more and more and accomplish great things and then you can retire. And because of that mentality that, you're, that oftentimes I see and can feel even in my own life, um, I see oftentimes life as, as feeling like a daily grind of kind of trying to do it all. And I've been pondering this even more since um, this last, these last two weeks have been the peak part of, of um, both myself and Pastor Miles' training for this Ironman we have coming up in two weeks. And this is a, it's a, it's a pretty daunting thing. Um, we're going to be swimming 2.4 miles, biking 112 miles, and running 26 miles, a marathon. And I know that both of us, I know he's going to talk about this a little bit next week as well. Um, it's just something that's on our minds a lot. And um, quite frankly, the last two weeks have been very difficult for, for me from that perspective because it's been the peak part of the training. And I did like a six-hour bike ride on Friday. And during the week, I would get up at, I'd get up at, I would get up between 4.30 and 5 so I could get my hour and a half workout in in the morning so I could still accomplish everything else I have to do during the day. And recognize, I'm choosing this, okay? But it's, it's, it's become, gotten to the point where Iron Man is kind of a swear word for me. So, so you say Iron Man, I'm like, oh, yeah, one of those things. But when I'm, when I'm running in the morning, a lot of times I find myself just thinking a lot because hour and a half is a long time. You got to get your mind on other things. And the main reason we're doing this, this Iron Man is to raise money for church workers. But I also, there's also that part of wanting to get to that finish line. And by God's grace, I'm praying that both Pastor Miles and myself can get there. And, and, but, but this is something you may not be aware of. When you get to that finish line, they say something. They actually, you actually hear somebody say, you are an Iron Man. Okay. And as I'm running on the treadmill, I'm like, all of this, just as somebody will say, you are an Iron Man. Yeah. Woo. Give me my medal and now I can go home and sleep, you know? I, 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 it's, but, but for me, it's, it's, it's very much, some, it, it represents a lot of what our lives look like. I told you we take on more and more and more. We have so many things going on. And there's oftentimes life can feel like one long treadmill run. And, and, you're, all, and you're doing it all. You're trying to accomplish it all so that you'll hear certain words. You're a good person. You're such a good mother. You're so successful. You're so accomplished. You do such great things in your life. You see, what, what is that voice? What is that voice you're, you're, you're just craving to hear from other people to, to give you that sense of accomplishment, to give you that sense of my life matters, my life has purpose? 
For some people, it's simply, it's simply hearing a doctor say you're healthy, you know, going through all the work, eating all the right things, doing everything you do. I mean, what are the things that you're doing in your life and what are you, all, what are you working towards? What are you working towards? The problem is when we're going through this daily grind of doing it all, there's a natural consequence for, for being too busy and trying to do everything and, and, and working so hard to hear one thing or certain things we start to find tension building up in our own lives, particularly, I would say, in our relationships. Because you can't keep all the, all the plates spinning. And, and, and if you're anything like me, a lot of times it can feel like you're, you're dropping some plates. And, and you may hear that voice in your head saying you're doing too much or you're not doing the right things or you get the idea. You may hear other people saying things to you like, you know, maybe you should try something different. Or maybe, maybe you should rethink your priorities or how you're doing things. And there's two typical responses that I find, two extreme responses that, that you can get. One, on the one side, you have, how many of you here are like the supermen or superwomen in the room where I can handle anything? You know? That's the one extreme. And I probably, I probably, I think we're all kind of somewhere in the middle, but I tend to gear more towards this way. It's like, it's like if you tell me I can't do it, well, by gosh, I'm going to do it. You know, I can handle it. And all I have to do is rearrange a few things and life will be just fine. <laughs> and then there's the other extreme, which is kind of victim mode, which is like everybody's telling me to do all this stuff and I can't do it all. I can't handle it all. But everybody has all these expectations on me. And you see, that doesn't work out well either. And all this does is it causes us to bunt heads with one another. You have chaos in our relationships, and we really lose perspective on life. And I want you to ponder today, especially this, this question. How does God return us to a healthy perspective on life, relationships, and our, and our daily responsibilities? How does he help us to see these things as good and have a healthy perspective on it all? And to help us, we're going to take a look at the book of Judges. And the book of Judges is a very difficult book of the Bible. Very, very difficult. If you've ever read it before, there's some really controversial stuff in there. Some incredibly amazing things you look at, you're like, this is in the Bible? Like, violence, okay? And, and crazy stories. And, and some people read this and it's just like, I had no idea this was in the Bible. But the main point of Judges is you have God's people, the Israelites, they're in the promised land place that God told them that they were going to live, and they are surrounded, though, they're surrounded by unbelievers, people from other nations. And it's a recipe for disaster, okay, because we all have that disease called sin, okay? And that disease turns us inward. It curves us in on ourselves saying, I, am, I matter most. I am right. You know, it, it, it turns us in ourselves. It makes us prideful. And at the same time, they're surrounded by people who are unbelievers who are tempting them to live a different way and look at life a different way. And so when sin is at work in your life and you're surrounded by people who, who, are, who are unbelievers, there's a great temptation to fall into evil. And this is what we find in Judges 4.1. It says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. We give in to sin very easily in our lives, especially when, when, when something that, that's being told, you know, when, we're, when we're, something's held out for us and we're told it's good and we should chase after it. And it's very easy to just follow our desires. But the problem is, with this, is sin, it leads me to assume I'm right. And so that looks good over there. Hmm, there's a nice, there's a, there's a cheap plot of land over there. It's a swamp. I should build a house on it because I can do it. It's cheap and I can live the dream. Wait a second though. Could there be problems? No, I'm right. How dare you tell me that I'm wrong? You see? That's what sin does, though. It convinces us that we're right. And when we find out what happens next in Judges 4, 2, it says, And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And you're saying, Pastor, does that mean that I'm going to be sold into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor? No. <laughs> what, this, what this teaches us, though, is that there's natural consequences to sin. Okay? There are consequences. If we're going to fall into evil, bad things are going to happen. And, and if I build my house <laughs> on swamp... I'm going to find my basement flooded, and, and, and I shouldn't sit there wondering, why is my basement flooded? Well, you know, you shouldn't build your house in a swamp. And, and what happens here is we, we recognize that sin has natural consequences. If I'm going to just insist that I'm right all the time, and I'm going to give in to my sinful nature, and I'm just going to go after my heart's desires and everything that I do, and I'm just going to go, 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 sin is going to have natural consequences that I'm going to experience in little ways and also sometimes in some very big ways. And we see this in our own culture. Perhaps this past week you saw, about, you saw heard about the, the riots in Charlotte. Sin has kind of a, it has a ripple effect. 
One person does something and then it kind of leads to other things. I remember um, I, as I taught for three years in a high school and I remember seeing kids coming into class, kids that would normally be in great mood, you know, and you could tell they're coming in, they're kind of in a bad mood and you know it was probably because something happened at home and now it's spilling over into school and it affects their attitudes toward other people and the next thing you know you have fights and all sorts of other things and it all started with one thing over here. And this is the kind of stuff that you see in our culture. You have one person making a bad choice, another person making a questionable choice, and not people not liking it. Next thing you know, you have people throwing bricks through windows and everybody screaming and yelling and howling at each other. Sin has consequences, doesn't it? And nobody's talking. This doesn't happen in our own lives though, right? Not at all. We never see any consequences like that in our own lives. Ripple effects. One thing happens, we get off balance here, we get a little too focused over there. Next thing you know, We have chaos and disorder at home. And this is what I want to focus on today, right here. This is what happened in Judges 4, 3. So after all that stuff happened, natural consequences, then the people of the Lord cried out for help. And the reason I want to focus on this is because this is what we don't see. What I see so often in the world is, is I'm going to be, I'm right, I'm going to do things my own way, I'm going to go that direction. I experience natural consequences, and then what do I return to? I'm right, I'm going to figure out all the right answers and I'm going to do things my own way. What you don't see so often, you don't see in the world around us is people calling out to God for help. But that's what we need. Martin Luther, he was a church father who, he started the Reformation many years ago. And if you're unfamiliar, basically this is what was happening. The church was basically promoting a lifestyle much like I was talking about before. In, in, in this case, it was your relationship with God is based on how, what, how much money you give, what you're doing here, what you're doing over there. If you, if you just do this, you'll be forgiven and you get to go to heaven. Okay? That's a basic idea. And Martin Luther read the Bible and said, this is not what this is about. It says you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And so he wrote 95 theses, okay? These are all in response to what the church was, was teaching. And the very first one that he wrote is this. He said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be repentance. The entire life, the entire life of believers should be repentance, okay? He's saying this, all of life is Repentance. And I'm going to turn to that in a second. But first I want to mention what, what is repentance? Repent, to repent means to turn. And so the idea is you're turning away from your sin, turning away from this brokenness, whatever I'm experiencing in my life. And in this case, we're talking about turning toward God. Now, the problem we have in the world today is, is, is not just that people aren't calling out to God. It's like we don't know which God we're calling out to. First of all, there's a problem. First of all, we don't want to change our behavior. We, don't, we like doing things our way. And so to turn away from sin and turn toward God of the Bible is kind of scary because the God of the Bible is going to, it's going to, it's, it's going to mean actually changing things in my life. And so what we, what we do so often when we turn to God is we like to turn toward a more generic God, okay? Because then I can kind of pick and choose who I want to keep over here as I turn away. And so what am I going to turn away from? Well, this kind of stuff I'll turn away from, okay? And when I turn to God over here, because God is... I have this generic idea of God in my head. I'm kind of turning him into something that looks a little bit more like me. I also start to believe strange things like if I turn to God, he's going to make my life easier. But that's not what the Bible talks about. And when Martin Luther is saying all of life, all of life is repentance, what he's saying is when you turn away from sin, you turn toward God as he is. And God works in incredible ways when we do that. In the book of Judges, when people cried out for help, what God did was he would send a judge, basically saviors. It'd be human beings that God would work through to save the people. In the case of what we read today, you hear about Barak and Deborah. And God called them, basically, to lead God's people. And what's interesting, though, is is human beings are very... We're we're sinful, okay? We like to do things our way. And Barak was the same way. God said, go do this. And Barak said, okay, I'll go do that. But Deborah has to come with me as like an insurance policy because... uh, I don't quite 100% trust what God said. (laughs) That's the kind of savior they had, okay? Who's our savior? You got a cross right here. And when we turn from our sin, we turn towards God, what we see is a savior who died for our sins to forgive us. You see, the substance, central substance of the Christian faith is one of repentance, turning from our sin, turning toward God, receiving his free gift, of grace. 
But the problem that I see a lot of times is we don't quite understand what repentance is. And we don't, we don't understand how it plays out in our lives as much. And it becomes kind of a me-centered thing. It's like, I'm going through this tough stuff. Turn to God. Well, what does that even mean? And, and, and I think this is probably, this would be a very helpful way of you, for you to think about it. To repent is, is really, is, is really it's, a, it's a God-centered thing, okay? Not a me-centered thing. And let me explain. So, so number one, to turn away from my sin, usually it means that I'm experiencing some hardship in life, okay? I'm experiencing a consequence. But all too often we're focused on the consequences of my bad choices or the sin of my life rather than the way that I've offended others and most importantly, God. Do you see the difference? Any of you have ever interacted with a young child that got caught doing something they shouldn't do? Pushed my sister on the ground. Mom and dad catches said offender and says, you're going to get into some trouble. What's the first words out of mouth? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What's the focus? It's on the consequence, not the offense that your sister's lying on the ground right there. And the same thing happens in marital relationships when husbands and wives, when they, when they go at it sometimes and, 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 you know, I don't like how this feels, so I'm going to say I'm sorry. But what am I, what am I focused on? Like if you're, if you're in a struggle in your marriage or and you're in an argument and, and your husband is, is saying something to you that you don't like and maybe, maybe you caused it, okay? But you don't like it because of the way it makes you feel, the consequence. And so instead of thinking about the offense, the way that you offended him or the way he might have offended you, what do we focus on? The consequences. And we say, I'm sorry. There's a huge difference. If we recognize that our sin offends God, and yet God who knows everything about us, we can't hide our offenses from him. If we recognize that he went to the cross for us anyway, it's humbling. And it, it helps us to recognize that this sin that we're hanging on to, this, this stuff over here that we're so determined not to let go of, it seems rather silly because he's over here giving his life for me, even as he knows how I trust in this stuff more than him sometimes. So we recognize that our sin is offensive toward God. That's where we start. And then we, re- we think about how we, we recognize that the price has been paid, it's not owed. You ever get in a mindset sometimes of, you know, I, you, know you, you, make, you do make a bad choice and then you gotta like make up for it? I believe that a lot of times when we, when we hurt one another, amends should be made that we, some, we should do things for others, right? But when, we're, when you play the martyr sometimes, it can go overboard. Imagine like a husband and wife having, a, having an argument about work and family balance, okay? Husband's at work, working hard, he hasn't been home at all. His wife's looking at him saying, where have you been? You should be home more often. And so this husband plays the martyr and what he does, he basically forsakes all of work to go over, be home, and he's home, he's home, he's home, he's home, he's home. Well, what's gonna languish? Work, so he gets his boss calling him, I need to come back over here, and now I'm gonna make up for it all at once over here. And then once again, if you see the cycle we get into, it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, acting as though we, are, we owe it. When we make a mistake, we have to make up for it all, all at once. But when you look to the cross, you see that the price for your sin has been paid. And when you look at your spouse, or if you look at your friend, or whoever you're struggling with, what you can do is you can recognize that my, I'm forgiven now, and we can sit down, we can look at this situation, and we can figure out how we might better establish balance, rather than overdoing it. <laughs> you see? So we, we start by recognizing how we have offended others, we recognize that Christ has paid the price for our offense. We're forgiven. And then lastly then, we recognize that we recognize the freedom we're given. Repentance is about freedom, not slavery. Now this is for the supermen and the superwomen in this room who think I can do everything, okay? We hang, I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you find yourself having that tendency in your life, you're, you're just gravitating towards certain things as your hope, okay? I think we all do this in our own way. I know we all do this. I do this, okay? We gravitate towards something, and this thing's going to be my hope. And the idea of, of turning away from this or, or, or acknowledging that this isn't working, it's scary. It's scary. And it can seem like to, to, to admit that you're wrong and that you can't handle it and that you need a true Savior 
It's enslaving. It can feel enslaving. So now I'm enslaved to, like, it, it, things aren't ever going to get any better, you know, right? But what Jesus does, what Jesus does is he offers us freedom. He offers us freedom. He says that this thing that I'm hanging on to over here, this thing I'm looking to for hope, it can't give you what I can give you. And what happens is, is, is Jesus frees us really to be transformed and to change and to leave some of these things behind, to look at him, live with other people, and order things more as he would want us to order them. You see, God's grace leads us to this whole thing from recognizing I've offended others. Well, God's grace helps me to see that God doesn't abandon me, okay? He's paid the price. He says, you are forgiven, and then he frees me to be transformed and to live a new life. And, and that's when I begin to experience the daily blessings of life in Christ. While I'm focused on the daily grind of doing it all, what Jesus calls us to is the blessing of living life in Christ. And instead of focusing all our attention constantly on hearing that voice, getting that affirmation from other people or whatever accomplishment we're trying to get, what Jesus does is he speaks to you and he says, you are forgiven. He speaks that voice to you now. And he says, you are free. You're free to live a new life. Could, imagine what it would be like if, our whole, if the whole culture in which we live, instead of turning against one another, would turn toward Jesus. And he'd recognize how, because of our sin, we have offended others. And we would recognize that the price has been paid, we are forgiven, and, and then we are free to turn towards one another and, and, and love one another and live in peace. Can you imagine what that would look like? We, don't, we never see it. That's just so, it's so hard to imagine. But you see here in the church, this is the life that God calls us to live. This is the culture he calls us to, a culture of repentance, a culture in which we recognize that all of life is about repentance, it's repentance and it's through the grace of God that it restores in us a right perspective on life, a right perspective on our relationships, and a right perspective on all the things he's called us to do. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may we live a life of repentance together for Jesus' sake. Amen.